so my trip, first trip was to Rwanda with an organization called Women for Women. Um, and initially I went really, because I was planning on making a donation, we have a family foundation, we give a certain percentage of money every year to different groups, and I thought this would be a great opportunity for me to see the work that they're doing in Rwanda, at the same time make a donation. Um, at the same time, um, take my camera and really kind of take this opportunity to take some fabulous pictures of a place I've never been. Um, when I came back, um, I was just so excited about the work I saw they were doing and I had made all these fantastic promises about making this great donation and I sort of came back to my husband and I said, oh, this is such a great place, I've made all these promises and he said to me, well, while you were gone, um, <clears throat> Lehman Brothers actually went bankrupt. And I said, well, that's terrible, but you know, thank God we don't work there. And he said, no, 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 this is like a global, this is a global problem, so um, we really aren't going to be making any donations for the next six months, certainly until we figure out what happens here. So this left me in a very um, awkward kind of place because I had sort of made all these promises. And um, for the first time it left me in a place as a woman saying, well, I'm either going to fulfill these promises or I'm just going to kind of sit back and wait and see what happens. And I went back to the organization and I said, well, I've kind of got this funny problem because the money I sort of promised you it really isn't there because of this problem right now um, globally. And I said, that's okay. You know, you, you have this great passion for photography, you know, let's do something there. And this was a really frightening moment in a moment in my life that I look at and say, I could have sort of stepped back and said, no, I don't do that professionally, which I didn't at the time, or I could have jumped on it and said, okay, great, let's sell my art. And, um, and I went for it, and I started selling my art, and it started to sell, and it was the most surprising thing ever, so I look back at that as this amazing turn in my life where this sort of disaster happened where I was so embarrassed and so sort of ashamed to come back from this trip that sort of changed my life and come back empty-handed. My first project was with Women for Women which is um, really about uh, microfinancing um, and training, vocational training for women. Um, I've done projects um, for New York University and they opened up a campus in Ghana which is really exciting. It's their approach to philanthropy was building um, a university so and sending kids from New York and opening up their campus to kids at the University of gone to come and listen so that was a very exciting project and I taught there for the week that I was there um, so I got a chance to meet these kids so we raised some money f for that school um, I worked in Haiti with the wonderful Melky Jean and her brother Wyclef Jean um, raising money for orphanages um, and for women's projects in Haiti one foundation I went to Malawi with them um, raising um, money for wonderful play pumps um, which are these merry-go-rounds that actually pump water um, doing a project with Virgin Unite um, their, with their Zimbabwe Trust and an upcoming one with um, an organization that works on an anti-bullying campaign in the United States. So that's kind of a new one for me at St. Peter's um, Cathedral in New York. I kind of just wing it, really. I just kind of get in the car and I just start to drive. And I will say, take me to a small village, take me to a market, or just stop the car on the side of the road. There's a group of people walking. And it really is about like being on this amazing scavenger hunt and just looking for this beautiful moment that I can bring back and show the West. Like there's just this beautiful, unusual scene that you just wouldn't see anywhere else. And I'm constantly looking for it. And I, I never know where I'm going to find it. Um, so I just keep on driving and stopping the car. And sometimes I take it out of the car. So I'll be literally just shooting out the car window and said, just slow down, click, and I got it. I, ju I just never know where it is. So it's just, and usually, you know, you sort of get there and you start to panic because I don't have a plan and I never have a plan. So I'm always thinking, I really should have a plan because how I know, how am I going to know I'm going to find this moment? And, you know, sometimes I'm on day three or day four and I'm thinking, I haven't found um, anything really that hasn't been done before or that I haven't done before. And then all of a sudden, day four hits and I, I find it, you know, and it could be anywhere. It could be at some little watering hole or it could be in a village or it could be at a school, it could be at a hospital. Um, it really depends on all the elements coming together for me, the light being right, the expression on the person's face being right, the clothing being right, the background being right, everything. So it's kind of a scary and exciting at the same time. What I'm trying to achieve is to bring back a moment in time, an image that um, will sell, actually, because the end game is to raise money for a charity for me. I mean, that is the purpose. I mean, as an artist, I want to create something beautiful, and every artist has this need to create, and you kind of wake up in the morning, and if you're not creating something, you're feeling a little bit useless, or maybe you've lost your... your, your, your thing and you can't do it again. So the creating part is, is a very important element, but equally important for me is, um, is selling this body of work and being able to give that money back to the charity. So if I'm going to become very 
invasive actually in a community's life and go and take pictures of their children and their family lives and their difficult situations in Haiti and, and, and really get in there and, and, and kind of invade that very personal space, I feel it has to be justified by me being able to say, well, I sold that picture and that money went back to help these people. Living in both worlds, living in a world with people who are sort of very successful and wealthy and, and live very comfortable lives, what we, what we, traditionally comfortable lives, um, and then living with people who are the extreme opposite, you realize that on both spectrums you have a tremendous amount of suffering um, and loneliness and then you have a tremendous amount of um, happiness and love and fulfillment in life on both ends. And I guess when I jump from one end to the other, I'm always trying to find and understand what is that common denominator that makes those two groups happy and then those two groups equally sad who, because their circumstances are so different, right? But yet some are suffering and some are not. I mean, I've met people in the most horrible of situations who've lived through the most horrific um, you know, wars and, and, and suffering and they're actually happy people. And I look at them and I say, how, how are you happy? How do you get up in the morning and sing when you, you, know, you head to the watering hole or to the river to collect your water? And you know, I'd like to gather these different comments and, and, and answers. Perhaps I'm looking for myself on some level, but what makes you happy? And a large, very often, I, I'm, I'm, I realize that what makes them happy is living in these communities. They have a sense, a real strong sense of clan community living. And they have many people they can rely on. Um, their husbands for some things, their, their girls for another, their girlfriends. There are many generations living together, so they've got their grandmothers, their mothers, their grandfathers. So this clan living tends to create very happy people because they've always got someone that will be there for them.